China has occupied Tibet, but India's traditional relations have always been with Tibet. Yes. So it should be India, Tibet, China, not just India and China. And even today, the Dalai Lama, when he talks about uh, Tibet, he says, we are students of the Nalanda school, Nalanda school which was in India, which was in India. And uh, till the time Nalanda was destroyed, Tibetan monks used to come to Nalanda to study. America was keen to step in and help, but America was dissuaded from doing so by both India and by Britain. Britain told America that Tibet is not your business, leave it to India. India took the line that the British had been following that Tibet was under the suzerainty of China. Hello and welcome once again to Kitabi Baate. I am Abhishek, also known as Bookswale Bhaiya. My guest today is Ambassador Dilip Sina, a career diplomat. Ambassador Sina served as India's ambassador to Greece, India's former representative to the United Nations in Geneva, and now a prolific public speaker and an author. Ambassador Sina, it's most certainly an honor to have you on Kitabi Baate. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, before we talk about your books and your latest book, which is on Tibet, I would mm. wanted to ask you a bit about your career in foreign services, your career as a, as a diplomat. If you would like to share some experiences, how was that career as a diplomat and how you think a career of a diplomat differs from that of a bureaucrat or an IPS? Well, uh, I had a long career uh, in the foreign service, served in about eight countries uh, in various positions. Uh, also served in Delhi. Now, a diplomat's career is entirely different from the career of uh, the other bureaucrats yes. in the civil services. Because the civil services in India are administrators, whether it is the IAS or it's the revenue services or the other services, they administer uh, the rules and regulations of the government. Whereas uh, a diplomat uh, represents the country abroad. So he has to liaise with a foreign government. Yes. And uh, that means that he's not administering anything. He's talking to them. So a, a, a diplomat's role, uh, I often thought, was somewhere between a salesman, uh, a, a businessman, uh, a cultural representative, a negotiator. So it's a completely different kind of uh, work to what uh, one would expect as a bureaucrat. Right. So uh, it would be closest to, I would think, a sales representative because you are expected to go out, yes. know about the country that you have been, you are created to. So you have to read about the country, how the people think, what the people, their history, their culture, understand them so that you are able to interpret them to your own country and then you are able to represent your country to them in a manner in which they are able to understand what India is about right. and what India wants to say or do. So it's a, it's a completely different kind of career. But I enjoyed it thoroughly because uh, I was always interested in international affairs. And uh, this career gave me the opportunity to not just travel the world, but also to live in countries and understand their civilization, right. which, which gives you a different kind of understanding of the world as compared to what you would if you were just a tourist or you were an academic studying in India. Right. I must say that's a very fresh perspective on foreign service in the careers and diplomat wherein you mentioned that even at times it's like a, a salesman, you know, you're representing hmm. your country. So yeah, coming to your book, your first book, which came in 2018 was in United Nations. Uh, what made you write on Tibet this time? The Security Council book I wrote because I dealt with the Security Council with the UN. So I felt that there were certain aspects that had not been highlighted enough in the working of the Security Council, its history, which was important for countries, for people to know. Uh, when it came to Tibet, this was something that I had thought of for a long time uh, in the course of my career, uh, both as a student and in the career. I, I felt that there was something missing in our uh, discourse on the India-China relations, as also on the India-China border dispute. disputes. Yes. Because I found that whatever books I read, whether by Indian or by foreign writers, would tend to focus on the India-China border dispute as if it was a, dis it was a border dispute, as a territorial dispute between China and India. And I always wondered, there is this huge country called Tibet, 
that is between China and India. Okay, China has occupied Tibet, but India's traditional relations have always been with Tibet. Yes. Historically, and they have been extremely close relations. So why is it that Tibet does not form part of the discourse? Even Indians do not bring Tibet into the picture. Yes. Uh, and that uh, completely distorts the, the situation or the discussion. Because uh, most books would tend to look at India's case on the territorial claims, find loopholes in them, pick holes in them, and then declare that since India's claim is weak, therefore China's claim is strong and therefore so, yes. India is wrong in this. And this has been the standard line with a lot of foreign writers and a number of Indians also fall in this trap. And I realized that unless you bring Tibet into the picture, you can never get the full uh, understanding of what is uh, at stake for India's security and for India's northern border. So it should be India, Tibet, China, not just India and China. It's a separate country after all on which China lays claim. But as you said, we typically have a myopic view. We look at only India and China and somehow forgetting Tibet. So coming to Tibet, I think the one key points in the history of Tibet was its annexation by China in 1950. But Tibet, as I read in the book, has a very vast history. It had a lot of interrelations with other countries, especially Mongolia and China as well. So we can elaborate a bit on Tibet's history. Well, actually, Tibet's earliest relations start with India. The longest ruling dynasty in Tibet started in about 2nd or 1st century BC and lasted till about the 9th century B, uh, CE, which is AD as we call it. Uh, so almost 9 to 10 centuries. This was the Yarlung dynasty. Yeah. Now, according to Tibetan uh, tradition, this dynasty was founded by a person who went from India and he belonged to Mahatma Buddha's family. Oh, okay. That is their tradition. Hmm. They look upon him from that point of view. So the very origin of this dynasty is from India. It's from India. Yes. And of course, thereafter you have Buddhism traveling to, to Tibet. And even today, the Dalai Lama, when he talks about uh, Tibet, he says, we are students of the Nalanda school. Nalanda school which was in India. Which was in India. Yeah. And uh, till the time Nalanda was destroyed, Tibetan monks used to come to Nalanda to study. Uh, the Tibetan language, the Tibetan script. Uh, Tibetan language, of course, belongs to a Tibetan, Tibetan Burman family, although the Chinese claim it belongs to a Sino Tibetan family, whatever that means. Uh, but the script was devised by uh, Tibetans and Indians working together based upon the late Brahmi script uh, from India. And the, all the religious textbooks of Buddhism, the uh, almost 300 volumes of them, are translated from Sanskrit and Bali, Bali books from India. And in fact, in the medieval age, when these books were being translated, this was by far the biggest translation work ever undertaken in history. So that is the kind of in, uh, relationship that India has with Tibet. Later, when uh, the, the Mongols became powerful, and the Mongols became powerful, as you know, under Chinggis Khan. Yes. What we call Chinggis Khan. Chinggis Khan. But the Mongol pronunciation, I believe, is Chinggis Khan. Chinggis Khan. So, uh, now Chinggis Khan's grandson uh, conquered Tibet, a chap called Gadan Khan, in 1240. And later on, another uh, grandson of Chinggis Khan was given the eastern portion of the great empire of created by Genghis Khan. He was called Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan. And he made a uh, peaching. It wasn't called peaching at that time, but it was called Dadu by the Mongols. He made Dadu his capital. Okay. And he ruled a vast empire from Dadu. Uh, the empire included Mongolia, it included Tibet, and a large all of modern China. In fact, he also conquered Yunnan, which was okay. not a part of China till right. then. It was the Mongols who conquered a Yunnan and annexed into the Mongol Empire. And in fact, the general who conquered Yunnan was, a, was an Arab general. So, uh, so Kublai Khan built this huge empire. Unfortunately, Kublai Khan did not, his dynasty did not last long. In about 100 years, his successors were weak. And the Han Chinese, they threw out the Mongols. 
Now, uh, when the Mongols were ruling Tibet, their relationship with Tibet was very peculiar. Although they were conquerors, yeah. they were greatly impressed by Tibetan uh, knowledge, Tibetan learning, especially Buddhism. So the Tibetan monks started teaching Buddhism to the Mongols and even devised the Mongol script. Ah, okay. So even today, when the Mongols, they, they greatly revere many of the uh, Tibetan monks. And when they read their Buddhist texts, sometimes, sometimes they read them in, in Tibetan language, Tibetan. even though they have it in Mongol language. So that's the kind of relationship that uh, Mongolia and Tibet have. And in fact, in 1904, when a uh, young husband invaded Lhasa, the 13th Dalai Lama fled not to China, he fled to Mongolia really? because he felt he would be safer in Mongolia than in China. And in China. fact, he lived in Mongolia for, a, for several years until he came back to Lhasa. So this is the relationship that Mongolia had with, with Tibet. Uh, Kublai Khan invited one of the Tib uh, Tibetan monks to come to his kingdom to help him organize the administration of his government because Tibetans didn't have a script, didn't have written texts. So they used Tibetans in their governance. Later on, when the, when the Mongols were overthrown, then the Ming Ch dynasty took over China. By this time, Buddhism has also spread to China through, uh, through Central Asia. So the Chinese knew about Buddhism. Uh, earlier, there, when the Tang dynasty was in uh, power in China, and the Tangs were half, half Turkish and half Chinese. So they had a lot of interest in Central Asia. Two of their princesses had got married uh, over a period of two centuries with the kings of the Yarlung dynasty. So there was interaction between China and Tibet also. But when the Ming dynasty took off on the Mongols, they continued their relationship with the uh, monks in Tibet. Uh, they would invite monks to come to China. They would send gifts. So the China claims that uh, Tibet belonged to, to China, to although China. Tibet was independent for all practical purposes in this period because the Mings did not treat Tibet as one of the provinces of the Ming Empire. It was only when the Ming dynasty was overthrown by another uh, people whom the Chinese called barbarians from the north, yeah. the Manchus in 1644. They came, they overthrew the Ming dynasty and they conquered China again. Yeah. Again, they were cousins of the Mongols. They were neighbors. Okay. And they also knew about uh, Tibetan Buddhism. So they also were interested in Tibetan right. uh, Buddhism. Right. So their kings also invited, the fifth Dalai Lama mm -hmm. was invited to Peking. By this time it was called Peking. Peking, Peking means the northern capital. Right. And the Mings had moved the capital there. Uh, so the uh, Manchu emperor invited the fifth Dalai Lama to come. He built a palace in his honor. Oh, okay. And the fifth Dalai Lama stayed for several months there. Again, helping the Manchus build their administration. Because they also required advice as from, from people who were who could right. write and had textbooks. And then, of course, the fifth Dalai Lama came back. The Manchus did invade uh, Tibet, primarily to throw out the Mongols, because the Mongols were still influential in Tibet, even when the Mings were there. Right. So the first time a Chinese army and the Manchu army came to Tibet was in 1720. Okay. Now, to get your, give you a parallel, 1720 is just 37 years before the Battle of Plassey. 1757. 1757. Yes. Right. So, China's conquest of Tibet, uh, which is historically accepted by China as the, as the conquest of Tibet, takes place around the same time as the British conquest of India. Of India. Yes. This, this is very interesting because when we often say about imperialism, we link it to Western imperialism. We talk about imperialism and you will say British imperialism. But this is, in a sense, an example of Chinese imperialism as well. It's, I think, only now that people are waking up to the fact that China is, in a sense, an imperial power and has grand imperial designs. But as you suggest in your book, the imperialistic tendencies of China goes back to like 17th, 18th century, that to the earlier part of 18th century. Yes, absolutely. China's, uh, uh, especially the Tang dynasty, which was the first dynasty that that was that built an empire. Uh, even before that, the the there were some dynasties 
which wanted to control, uh, sent armies into Central Asia. One of the reasons why China was interested in Central Asia was that Central Asia had these tribes, these nomadic tribes, which constantly invaded China. Okay. So which is why China built the Great Wall to protect China from these people. And China also imported a lot of horses and other uh, other items from Central Asia. So very often China did send troops across to, to Central Asia. In fact, in the 8th century, there was a big battle between the Arabs and the uh, Tang Chinese in which yes. the Chinese were defeated. So, uh, yes, this, uh, this, this idea that uh, imperialism is a European concept is of course there primarily because we all grew up at a time when European imperialism was the most dominant, dominant the one. Correct. They had they ruled over almost the whole of the world. Right. But one country that did not rule over was China. Was China. China was never conquered and never ruled over by Europeans. Right. And that is extremely important. That although China claims that it went through a century of humiliation, the fact is that China also collaborated with the Europeans. Yes. Uh, and as I have brought out in my book. Uh, at a time when China was in, in deep trouble because of uh, the European predations along the border uh, and the, the Han Chinese had revolted against Manchu rule in the middle of the 19th century, China would have collapsed. Yes. But for British help, the British started helping the Chinese to, uh, to, for the empire to survive. In fact, parts like Xinjiang had broken away. Tibet also had become practically independent. And uh, it was the British, also helped by the Russians, who yes. ensured that the Chinese empire did not collapse. Because both China and Britain were scared that if the Chinese empire collapsed, then the other side would get the lion's share of the, of the country. Of the country. And they right. did not want that to happen. Right. So in their collaboration, they collaborated to ensure that the Chinese empire remained intact. Right. And China took full advantage of this later on to expand its, uh, its empire. So there again, we see that China, the Britain and Russia and their struggle for power, which is the great game, their hold mm. over Central Asia. Interestingly, they did not rule China, but there's one instance you mentioned in your book wherein Britain did briefly attack China. Uh, for a while, somewhere in the 19th century. And also at the same time, it is very interesting that Britain did not directly rule Tibet, whereas it could have. They were able to rule a large country such as India and Tibet was a very smaller country. They did not rule it themselves, but let China do that. So they did their bidding through China. So how, why do you think uh, that happened? Uh, again, part of the great game. Yes. The rivalry between Britain and uh, <laughs> Russia, Russia. Uh, was very strong. It came from Europe. But in Asia, the problem was they did not know Central Asia well mm. enough. The first explorations into Tibet by Europeans was actually in the early 20th century. Okay. They didn't know anything about Tibet. Uh, the Russians also started exploring Central Asia only towards the end of the 19th century. And you can go through those reports written by the explorers, both British and Russian. So they are, both were moving forward very cautiously because they're very scared of what was there in these mountains. Now, Britain had conquered, uh, invaded China. The first opium war took place around 1840. Yes. In the first opium war, China invaded only the southern capital, which was called Nanjing, And then they forced China to give Hong Kong to them and make them trade concessions. Then they withdrew from Nanjing. Now, the impact of this was that uh, the Han Chinese, when they saw the Manchu rulers were being defeated, they were rose in revolt and there was a revolt called the Taiping Rebellion in China, which shook China. Manchu Empire was actually down to its knees. Around this time, another incident took place in the sea because of which Britain again invaded China. And this time the troops went all the way to Beijing. And in 1860, that means 20 years after the first Opium War, this is called the Second Opium War, uh, British and French troops, they combined, uh, they attacked together. They went to Beijing and they occupied Beijing and the Manchu emperor fled north to Manchuria. That was his homeland. And he died over there. Okay. So the entire kingdom of China was at the mercy of the British. British. But the British were very scared. Why? Because the Russians were already present in Beijing. They had an embassy in Beijing. It was an ambassador in Beijing for over a century. 
Okay. Because Russians had come through Central Asia right. and they had opened a mission in Beijing and they had good relations with the uh, Manchu rulers uh, in, in China. So when the British reached Beijing, they had no idea of what they were in for. They had come by the river, by yes. boats. And Elgin was the commander of these forces. Uh, the Russian ambassador told Elgin, very well, you have, you have reached here. But remember, within a few months, winter will set in. The river will freeze. Your boats will not be able to go back. And you will be butchered by these, these barbarians who will come down from the steppes. And the British had no idea what, what lay beyond Beijing. Right. So Elgin immediately came back to the port of Tianjin because he didn't want to stay in Beijing. And the Manchus, of course, were also very, uh, the emperor had left behind his brother as the regent. So the, the brother went and told the British, whatever you want, whatever terms you want, I'm prepared to accept. So the British imposed a very heavy fine on the Chinese. He agreed okay. to pay that. And the, uh, the brother, he was King uh, Prince uh, Kung, or Prince Gong, as he's called, uh, he convinced his fellow Manchus that look, you already have the Han Chinese on your throat because they have right. rebuilt. If you also fight the British, you stand no chance. So at least yes. collaborate with the British to get the Han Chinese suppressed first. So he collaborated with the British and the British started helping the Chinese build their army, build their navy. Britain changed its law, no. okay. which, which prohibited a British subject from entering the rule of another, another country. So for China, they made an exception. So a British national, a British serving officer could join the Chinese army or the Chinese navy. And it was a Chi it was a British naval officer who built the Chinese navy, got ships ordered from Britain. A British, uh, uh, he was, I think was I think, a captain or a colonel or whatever, a person called Charles Gordon. He famously came to be called Chinese Gordon because he was commanding Chinese forces. Okay. And uh, he trained the Chinese forces and then he fought alongside the Chinese forces to crush the Taiping Rebellion. Taiping Rebellion. And then when uh, China, Britain was very keen that China also go and reoccupy Xinjiang. Uh, but China said they didn't have any money. So Britain loaned money to, the, to China to help them go and reconquer Xinjiang. Because again, Xinjiang or East Turkestan was very close to Russia and Britain did not want Russia to come in. And Britain did not have the the courage or the strength to go in itself. Now, this is something that's very difficult for our people to understand. Right. We right. always think of Britain as a great, great power, power which ruled the, the world and to yes. the world. But the point is that Britain was essentially a naval power. Right. On sea, they were rulers, they were kings. They could they could defeat any navy in the world. But on land, they were vulnerable. Hmm. And you had seen the vulnerability first when Napoleon uh, rebelled in yes. Europe. Yes. The British could not defeat him. They required Russian and Prussian help to defeat Napoleon on land. In Afghanistan, when the British stationed their troops in Kabul uh, in 1839-40, there was a rebellion in Kabul and the entire British force was butchered. Mm -hmm. So the British are very scared of going into the mountains yes. where railways could not go in, troops supplies could not go in. So they felt that if China controls these regions, it's much safer than Russia controlling. Russia controlling. Because China was under their control, their mission in Beijing was on very good terms with Prince Kong. Right. So China so, did fit the bill of a China being a small imperial power yeah. which could rule yes. on their behalf. Yes. And it led what we see especially in Amsterdam and in fact to an extent in India as yeah. well. We, we all know what China yeah. did to India. Yeah. So, and you can see that game being played out even later. Yes. During the Cold War, America reached out to China to crush the Soviet Union. Soviet Union. So That's it's the right. same game that the British had been playing earlier, right. which the Americans understood only when Kissinger told them about this. Yes. Because he was the person who had read history. Right. And knew that China could be used against Russia. Right. So what we saw, what happened with China with Tibet. Mongolia is an interesting case in point. We talk about Tibet, you know, it's still under a Chinese sovereignty. How did Mongolia manage to gain independence then? That is very interesting because, uh, you see, in uh, on India's northern border, Britain was very keen that Russia should not come in. Could not come, yes. So it wanted the Chinese to come in as a buffer, both in uh, Xinjiang and in Tibet. But north towards Siberia, they were not all that concerned. 
Right. So when Russia started moving towards Mongolia, they felt that it is safer for Russia to move into Mongolia. It doesn't affect their British Empire in India, uh, and it satisfied Russia. Yeah. So so Russia also was was okay with the idea of uh, getting compensated in Mongolia for uh, giving up claims in Xinjiang and in Tibet. So Russia uh, moved into Mongolia, especially when China became weak, the overthrow of the Manchu dynasty. Then there were a lot of negotiations between China and Russia over a period of time, coming right down up to Stalin. When, when Stalin uh, told uh, Mao Zedong to invade Tibet, but Mongolia, he kept under his sphere of influence. And even in the, in the Yalta conference that took place after the Second World War, right. uh, to decide where which country would fall in whose sphere of influence, Mongolia was given to the Soviet Union. So uh, Mongolia had a, a, a so-called communist government, which was beholden to the Soviet Union. So it remained under the Soviet influence until when the Soviet Union collapsed. Collapsed, right. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, Mongolia declared independence. Right. So the rest of the world recognized Mongolia's independence, and China also was compelled to do that. Although China still claims Mongolia, and in fact, if you look at China's list of conquests, right. Mongolia forms one of them. Oh, and there's a record that uh, one of the Chinese rulers who had gone to Russia had told them that Mongolia you have occupied is not part of your part of the uh, influence. But somehow it feels Mongolia might just got lucky, which yes. uh, Tibet unfortunately yes. did not. So coming back to the era of 1950, when uh, imperialism was to an extent over and we saw after India's independence, many other countries also uh, gained independence. Interesting thing to note here is that China invaded uh, Tibet. It was raised in the United Nations as well, but did not gain much uh, traction. And especially in an era where we are talking of you know, end of imperialism mm -hmm. and colonialism. So why you think that happened? Why it did not gain much traction in, even in the United Nations? And how do you see India's role in that? Because India leadership at that time was quite pro-Chinese. Pandit Nehru uh, envisaged in India-China union of sorts, the base of which was anti-colonialism. And yet what uh, China did was typically what any imperial power would do. So why you think neither United Nations nor India, which had a very critical role to play, uh, they failed to do anything meaningful for Tibet. Hmm. One of the interesting things here is that in 1945, when the Second World War ended and the United Nations was formed, almost two thirds of the world was under colonial rule. Right. But Tibet was not. Tibet was independent. Independent. Tibet, yes. Tibet was independent. Tibet had its own uh, region. The Dalai Lama was still a minor. Today, um, over a hundred countries have become independent. And uh, Tibet is under occupation. occupation. Now, the question arises, why is it that when China attacked Tibet, nobody came to Tibet's rescue? Tibet appealed to the US, to the UK, to India and to the UN for help. But none of these three countries came to its rescue. The matter was taken up in India also refused to take up the matter in the UN. The matter was taken up by El Salvador in the General Assembly. Uh, in the General Assembly, there was a very perfunctory debate uh, in which uh, India said that peace talks are taking place between Tibet and China. Therefore, it should be possible for an agreement to come through. So this matter should be shelved. Britain supported that. America also supported that. And the matter was shelved, never to be taken up again. Now the question arises, why is it that these yes. countries did not? did not? And here the most important influence is Britain's influence. Okay. Because America was inclined to take up the matter. Remember this was October, November 1950. Right. The Korean War had already started. So the Cold War had already begun in full, full form. It was, there was a full blown war taking place in Korea. Yes. And America had started seeing the world as Communist versus capitalist. capitalist. Uh, so America was keen to step in and help, but America was dissuaded from doing so by both India and by Britain. Britain told America that Tibet is not your business, leave it to India. India took the line that the British had been following that Tibet was under the suzerainty of China. Because Britain had signed treaties with Russia, yes. not with China, with Russia, 
acknowledging uh, Tibet as being under the suzerainty of China. So Britain adhered to its agreement with Russia that Tibet should be part of the Chinese empire. Chinese empire. And uh, Mao Zedong received help from the Soviet Union, from Stalin, when he was invading Tibet. So Britain uh, dissuaded both the US from interfering and India, of course, followed the British policy with the result that nobody took up Tibet's cause. Right. And uh, Tibet uh, lost its, uh, the UN never interfered in Tibet, although in the case of Korea, which was which had taken place just three, four months before, the UN had authorized military action, which was led by the US in Korea. And it was a very difficult war. Right. If you remember, American troops went there, then they were defeated, they, were, they went back again. And General MacArthur wanted to use the nuclear bomb there. And finally, after two, three years, a ceasefire was negotiated. Yes. So it was a very difficult war. Mm. But because of the American intervention in Korea, China was unable to attack Taiwan at that time. China wanted to attack Taiwan. Uh, but it attacked Tibet because it wanted to take Tibet and then free up its forces for the Korean War. Right. Now, you asked about India's policy. Why did India pursue this policy? Now, India pursued the British policy, but for a different reason. It accepted that Tibet is under the suzerainty of, of China, even though it knew full well that Tibet had historically, historically been an independent country. Yes. In fact, as I have pointed out, even Jawaharlal Nehru, our first prime minister, in his book, The Discovery of India and the Glimpse of the World History, he has written about Tibet and he's referred to it as an independent country. Independent country. So it is not as if he did not know that it was right. an independent country. But he, he had larger issues in mind. And he had two major issues. One was he thought that uh, there was a third world war going to take place because China would attack Taiwan and there was a Korean war going on. And he felt that India could be a good mediator in this between the capitalist and the communist world. Right. And India should not compromise its neutrality by bringing us Tibet. So Tibet became a victim of, of his uh, larger global policy. And the other, I think, was that to a great extent, Tibet's theocratic regime hmm. uh, did not appeal to him. Hmm. The idea of, of an incarnation and a yes. uh, Dalai Lama ruling did not appeal to uh, Nehru at all. Right. So uh, he felt that communism was the new new wave that would, would come up and he wanted India and China to be to work together against European imperialism right. and for Asian resurgence. Right. And Tibet became unfortunately a victim of, this. victim of this. So I say that that we misread uh, China, yes. communist China, which is actually an imperial power bent upon interfering in other affairs of other countries. But we treated it as a new force for of Asian right. resurgence. Right. Because this is also mentioned in many books that when the communists came to power in 49 in China, after a lot of bloodbath hmm. and many foreign experts, including Sadar Vallabhai Patel, who was hmm. the home minister, he was not in favor of India giving recognition to China. And despite, you know, these uh, suggestions, Pandit Nehru was among the first world leaders hmm. to give a recognition to China. So somewhere this uh, feeling towards China, you can say probably they got a bit enamored by China and the idea of, you know, building this anti-imperial front that the leadership definitely failed to see the writing on the wall. And I think Tibet was definitely would have been expecting help from uh, uh, India, but we all know it did not happen. And as you said, you know, we had a long history with, uh, with Tibet, but mm -hmm. somehow it did not happen. Interestingly, after a few years, India did give, uh, you know, refuse to a lot of Tibetans and uh, in lakhs, I think many Tibetans are still living uh, in India. But still, it's somehow or the other, would you say, the uh, failure of the leadership at that time to do what was actually required? Well, actually, what happened was that uh, Tibet, uh, we told Tibetans that they had to patch up with China. Yes. So they signed an agreement in 1951. Mm -hmm. After the agreement was signed, uh, the Chinese army moved into Lhasa. And the Dalai Lama, in fact, visited Pichin in 1954. But he came back disillusioned and uh, many people are very angry with the Chinese. And by this time, China has also gained in confidence and has started uh, repressing the people. Uh, in 1956, uh, the Dalai Lama came to India for the 2500th Parinirvan yes. uh, Divas of uh, Mahatma Bhut. And at that time, he wanted to stay on in India. But Nehru persuaded him to go back. 
Okay. So he went back to China. But by this time, a revolt had started in China. The Kampa rebellion had started. And uh, the Americans by this time had started helping the Kampa rebels. Mm -hmm. 1957 was the first time the Americans started helping. India did not uh, cooperate with that. Uh, so they used East Pakistan as the base for helping the Kampa rebels. Uh, because of this rebellion, there was a huge repression in, in Tibet. And in 1958, if you remember, Mao started what was called the Great Leap Forward, Great Leap Forward. in which, which 7 million people were yes. killed in China, yes. in Tibet also, yes. monasteries were destroyed. So Dalai Lama was, uh, was there was imminent danger of he being arrested. So he fled from right. uh, Tibet and he came to India. When he came to India, uh, India did the right thing by giving him asylum. Yes, not gave him asylum, it gave, also gave him the honor. He was given a guard of honor in Tawang when he was brought in as an honored guest. So. We realized that we had made a mistake in, 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 in Tibet, but we did not again realize the full consequences of giving shelter to the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. uh, because we thought that China would ignore that. Right. But China, as you know, is extremely sensitive yes. about the Dalai Lama. And uh, China invaded India in 1962. I'm positive, my view, not because of the territorial dispute. It was because to, to slap India for having given shelter to shelter the Dalai Lama. Yes. And even today, uh, I read just the other day that uh, till 2008 or so, there would be Tibetans fleeing Tibet. But now China is building this, uh, this uh, not only stationed its troops there, but also building villages, okay. which are entirely subsidized by the mm -hmm. Chinese government. And all this is being done to ensure that Tibetans don't flee. And they stay there. And stay there. stay there. Right. So we talked about how Western powers, you know, subjugated uh, Tibet. But do you see at any point of time it was a mistake on the part of Tibetan leadership or maybe the Dalai Lama said because they had a very different relation with Mongols. It was not a typical, you know, imperial or subjugated power relation. So do you think they would have expected some leniency or kind of freedom from the Chinese as well and did not understand the Chinese threat? Considerably so. Uh, see, when the when the Manchus conquered China, right, the Manchus were also Buddhists, yes, and they revered the Lamas. So, the the the, the Lamas thought that they had what is called they call the Cho uh, Cho Yon relationship, okay. which is the uh, priest patron relationship. Okay, that Tibetans are the priests, mm -hmm. and uh, the patrons are the Chinese, but the Manchu rulers of China. And so they got, uh, whenever a Lama visited China, he would be honored and given lots of gifts and sent back. So they did not treat the Manchus as foreign rulers. Right. The Manchus had stationed uh, a, a person called an Amban, mm -hmm. who was something like a halfway between a, a viceroy and an ambassador. But he would be there with a very small force and the, Man and the Amban was always a Manchu, never a Han Chinese. In fact, Han Chinese were not permitted to come to, 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 to Tibet by the Manchu rulers. Okay. So it was only when the Manchu dynasty almost collapsed that China started sending Han Chinese across. And the first interaction that the Tibetans had with the Han Chinese uh, was, was in Sichuan. The governor of Sichuan was a chap called Chao Erfang, who invaded Lhasa in 1910. And he's called the butcher of Tibet okay. because he killed so many people. Right. But soon after that, the dynasty itself collapsed and Chao Erfang was killed. And the Chinese troops were sent back through Britain. So uh, this 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 thing about uh, Chinese, uh, uh, the way the Tibetans looked at the Manchus was that here are these patrons, they are they are a powerful military force, and they can protect us against other foreigners. Now, who were the foreigners who were threatening Tibet? One was Nepal. Yes, there was an invasion by Nepal. Repeated invasion by Nepal. And in fact, in 1793, the Qianlong Emperor sent a force to punish Nepal uh, because Nepal had cons consistently raided, several times raided uh, Tibet. Tibet. Then in the 18, mid 19th century, Zorawar Singh from the ruler of Jammu, he was the general of the ruler of Jammu, he invaded Tibet. Okay. Then 10 years later, 15 years later, the Nepalese again invaded Tibet. Now by this time, the Manchu rulers had become very weak. So they were not able to defend Tibet. But Tibetans still believed that if the time comes, as happened in 1793, 
they will send an army to protect us. Okay. And since they saw the Manchus as Buddhists, whereas these uh, Europeans as uh, as foreigners of a different religion, and mind you, North India was also not ruled by by Buddhists or by Hindu rulers at this time. It was under the control of Muslim rulers. Muslim rulers, yes. So uh, that again became a factor. Right. So the Tibetans looked at the Chinese, especially the Manchus, as their benefactors. Now, when the uh, when Mao Zedong's forces attacked Tibet in 1950, many China, many Tibetans believed that after all, we have lived with the Manchus for so long. They were yes. good people. They patronized us. So maybe the Chinese are also equally be equally right. good. So many Chi many Tibetans were quite taken in by this by the promises. And in the first few years, the the, the instructions given to the Chinese troops was: you behave well, you right. treat them, don't take food from them, don't plunder them. But they did have designs on Tibet, which later the on, Tibetans yes. later on uh, they start failed to see. Yeah. Because I mean, the communist rulers, Mao Zedong particularly, he killed so many Chinese, of his own yes. people. Own people. As is happening even now. I mean, the, no, the, the, the right. repression that, that this totalitarian regime right. has on his own people. Right. Their passports are being taken away. Their, of course. So all these, it is much worse in Tibet because Tibetans are not, not even Han Chinese. Right. In fact, in 1950, when we see emergence of China, it started with the act of bloodbath, a lot of bloodbath in 1940 yeah. and the communists yeah. came to yeah. power there. So it started in the Great Leap Forward, the yeah. Tiananmen Square massacres yeah. and yeah. all it's a wild, wild, wild history of, you know, killing its its yeah. own people who dare to protest. Yeah. So in the history of uh, Tibet, you mentioned in one of your interviews a fact wherein some princess got married and she carried some books and which led to China laying claim. If you can elaborate a bit on that, what exactly was that? Yeah, this is very interesting. Uh, what is China's claim to Tibet? When hmm. did Tibet become a part of China? Right. The historians in China are not in agreement on this. Hmm. They give different dates. Some say it became a part of China when the Manchus conquered in 1720. Some say no, it was earlier when the Mongols conquered in 1240. Some say no, earlier still in the Tang dynasty, the Tang dynasty had uh, over a period of two centuries married a princess to the Tibetan king. Now, the Tibetan kings were very powerful at that time. And in fact, they had invaded uh, China. And once the uh, Tibetan forces attacked the Chinese capital and plundered it. So uh, as part of this, they got Chinese princesses. As you know, in those days, as part of the plunder, yes. there used to be a princess also who would be taken in by right. That was the, the, the prize that the victor king, the victorious king got for, for winning the war. But the Chinese interpret it differently. They say, look, because the Chinese princess got married to Tibet, therefore Tibet became a part of China. And uh, these princesses brought with them various gifts with them as part of the dowry. They would bring some books. They would bring some statues of the Buddha. So the Chinese, the Tang emperors sent whatever they thought would please the, China, the Tibetan king along with the princess. But, they, uh, but communist China today has a different interpretation of that. And it feels that these princesses came and conquered Tibet and Tibet became a part of China. Okay. Which is why they, hmm. they now claim that Tibet is a part of China since ancient times. Since ancient times. Which is what their, their press release recently right. said. But the, these are like very random views which are propagated and you know they become kind of a truth. There are several instances in history, for example, drawing of the Durand line, which segregated you know Afghanistan, Pakistan, which is a very arbitrary line. Partition of India itself, Saira had to do this line, so did not know anything mm -hmm. about India. But yet, these random acts ultimately defined destinies of many uh, countries and, and many nations. So, my uh, two core more questions. One is on the role of United Nations. So, Tibet is one example wherein it did not uh, pay attention, even though it was a country like any other country on the globe. And yet, we you just discussed how it was kind of neglected in the United Nations General Assembly. What do you see the role of United Nations? Do you think it has been able to fulfill its role uh, very well in the past couple of decades, like in, in intermediating between countries or in stopping wars or any such situations for which it was, this United Nations was made? Well, yes, you see, the United Nations was formed uh, for maintaining peace and security. Yes. And the Security Council was formed for that purpose. Uh, the United Nations successes have been in other fields in the fields of health and development right. and other areas. But in the field of security, 
the arrangement that they had devised in 1945 was that the five major powers, they included China also in that, for historical reason, for the first, uh, Second World War, during the Second World War, uh, that these five countries would together maintain peace in the world. But as we know, these five countries split thereafter and the Cold War started. Yeah, right. So the Security Council became defunct. Now, in 1950, when the Korean War started, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Security Council had authorized military action in Korea because of which UN troops were sent to right. Korea. But how did that happen? That happened because for a period of six months, the Soviet Union had boycotted the Security Council because they wanted that communist China should be given the seat of China, not the Republic of China, which is Taiwan. Right. So for six months, including in June 1950, they were not present at the Security Council. So uh, the other four countries got together, Taiwan and the other countries, and they got the resolution adopted for a UN action in Korea. And then, of course, the Soviet Union realized its mistake and came back and then started blocking. So no further military action was could, could take place. But in the case of Tibet, the interesting thing is that on Tibet, the permanent five were all in agreement because they followed the agreement that had taken place between Britain and Russia right. in 1907, that Tibet is a part of, of China. China. So they adhered to that. The Soviet Union supported uh, that the matter be rejected. The British said no, no discussion on the matter. So the result was that the five permanent members were unanimous that the UN did not interfere to rescue Tibet. Right. Now, that problem continues to today. There was only a very brief period between 1990 and 2011 when uh, the Soviet Union had broken up and Russia was still quite weak. Uh, when uh, the Western powers got a number of resolutions adopted for military intervention by the UN Security Council, like, for example, in Kuwait and then there were other areas. Now, uh, that phase is now over. Now, again, the, the P5 had split into two camps. Yes. Russia, China on one side and the other three on the other side. Yeah. So the UN being a, a, a member driven organization is not an international government. Right. It can take action only when the five permanent members agree. Right. If they don't agree, they can't do anything. Right. So the last question. So we you just talked about the state of affairs in the UN Security Council. And with the fact that China is not emerging, it has emerged as a kind of superpower and has great imperial designs. Do you see any hope for Tibet to become an independent sovereign nation? Well, China is not not becoming. China is a superpower. superpower yes. China is a superpower. It's the second largest economy by some reckoning as the largest economy in the world. It has a huge defense expenditure. It is the world's largest navy, perhaps, perhaps the world's largest army. So it's, it's, it's a superpower. In fact, this is a much more powerful superpower than the Soviet Union ever was. Right. Because the Soviet Union was almost always a military superpower. It was yes. never an economic superpower. Economic superpower. Correct. China is also an economic superpower, which is how China is able to now sustain this whole economy of relations with Russia, with Iran, with North Korea, with Pakistan, the BRI. So China is a very, is a very powerful superpower. And this is what America has realized, that China is now becoming a, not just a competitor, it's a threat. Right. To, to American supremacy in the world. So uh, this is uh, something that that is that is a, is a reality that we have to reckon with. And in this situation, you quite rightly say, there doesn't appear to be any hope for Tibet. The hope for Tibet is lies in the fact that Tibet, that China has not been able to win the hearts and minds of the people of Tibet. Tibet. Despite all 75 years of rule, they have not been able to uh, convince the Tibetans that they should be part of China, which is why Tibetans are still fleeing. The Chinese don't trust the Tibetans. Tibetans can't get a passport right. until they become very senior citizens and they are too old to do anything. Uh, foreigners are not allowed to travel to Tibet. Indians certainly are not allowed to travel to, to Tibet. Uh, so uh, in this situation, things don't look very good for Tibet, but the hope is still alive and will remain alive because you must remember 75 years may seem a long time in the life of an individual, obviously right. for a lifetime. Right. But in the history of a country, it's a very small period. The right. British ruled India for over 150 to 200 years. Yes. Uh, the Portuguese ruled over Goa 
for 450 Four years. years. And when they left, nobody ever asked this question, what happened to the Portuguese? They even left after the British left, after no, all those 1961. Years, 1961. Well yes. after. Yes. So, uh, and the Portuguese treated Goa as a province of yes. Portugal. Right. At least in theory, China calls Tibet an autonomous region. But the very fact that uh, the party secretary in Tibet has always been a Han Chinese. No Tibetan has ever become a member of the Politburo mm. in Beijing because they don't trust the Tibetans. Right. So this is the real hope for Tibet that as and when the geopolitical situation changes, there will be hope for Tibet. Right. So well, let's hope that happens and every Tibetan in Tibet as a country lives as a free country in, in all senses, not as a uh, sovereign the sovereignty of any other country. Uh, Ambassador, it was a pleasure talking to you. I must say it was a master class in history and not just another podcast. It was wonderful talking to you and I wish you a long and healthy life. Thank you. Thank you. Jim.